Okay. I, I saw a big thumb there. Does that mean it's okay? Uh, right. Oh, okay. Right. Um, welcome everybody to the uh, to today's meeting of the audit committee um, on the 10th of December. Um, th this is this is a, a virtual event, and we will have members of the public listening in if um, if they are so if they are there. Before anything goes on, I have to read um, a prepared brief for everybody from the chair. So good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the audit committee. I'm Councillor Peter Adams, chairman of the committee, and I'm obliged to inform you that this meeting is being live streamed at and recorded. Members of the public will be able to hear the audio of the meeting and view the papers shown on the screen. This meeting is being held using remote technology and should any committee member experience technical difficulties during the meeting, they should immediately contact the designated IT officer on the number they have already been supplied with. Everyone is requested to mute their microphones unless asked to speak. Please only use the chat function to indicate the desire to speak and do not use it for anything else so that it is clear who is speaking and the debate has to be heard by those listening to the audio feed. As chairman, I would interpret the council's existing standing orders in light of the requirements of remote participation with advice from the monitoring officer prior to making a ruling. At the start of the meeting, I will ask members of the committee to confirm their presence and any disposable pecuniary interest they have uh, in any of the items on the agenda. I will ask everyone that speaks during the meeting, including members of the committee and officers, to introduce themselves each time they speak. This is so that those listening know who is speaking. Now, I'm going to do the roll call and ask for um, declarations of pecuniary interests. So I'll start. So uh, Peter Adams is chairman. I am present and I have no pecuniary interests. Uh, Councillor Williams. Yeah, I'm definitely present and uh, I have no pecuniary interests either. OK, uh, Councillor Wood. Uh, Michael Wood, yes, uh, chairman and uh, have no interest to declare. Councillor Mellings. Hello, chairman. Yes, I'm present and I have no interest to declare. OK, I shall now turn to the items on the agenda. Uh, first item, is, oh, sorry, uh, Councillor Ewan Jones. No, He's right apologised, oh. Peter. Right, oh, so we've got apology, so apologies, Michelle, from Councillor Ewan Jones. From Councillor Ewan Jones. Thank you. Right. Um, and he he's not allowed a substitute, so he's just not here. Um, We've had the, the minutes of to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 29th of October 2020. This is item three. Uh, does anyone um, does anyone wish to propose them? Uh, propose them, Chairman Councillor Michael Wood from Warfield. OK, uh, anyone wish to second? Chris Mellings, yes, happy to second that, Chairman. OK, thank you. Right, uh, have we any any items arising from that? No, no, Chairman. No. OK, then I take it that that is that is uh, passed. Right. Item four, public question time. No public any... questions have been received. OK, uh, item five, members question time. Any members questions? No member questions have been received. Okay. Right, so we go straight on to item six. Second line assurance, Treasury strategy, mid-year reports. And the Director of Finance uh, asked to introduce himself and uh, give his uh, report. Thank you, Chair. Uh, James Walton, Council's uh, Director of Finance. Uh, this is the, uh, the Treasury strategy for 2021. It's the mid-year review paper. It will be going on to Cabinet um, and then Council uh, next week. So it's just the standard report that provides you with an update of the, um, uh, the, the Treasury management uh, approach and processes that have been undertaken for the first um, six months of uh, the financial year. 
Um, the one key point to note is that the, um, uh, the, the, the Treasury team has actually produced a return of 0.62% um, on the Council's cash balances, <coughs> which outperforms its benchmark by 0.68%. Uh, and that's because the benchmark is actually a, a negative figure, given the way that the um, uh, base rates have changed across a number of uh, countries across um, uh, Europe, etc. Um, it's actually now a negative uh, return is the benchmark for, uh, for cash balances, which is why we've, uh, the team have performed in that way. Um, there have been some changes in relation to um, PW, PWLB, so the Public, Public Works uh, Loans Board. Uh, changes have been made in relation to borrowing, uh, and uh, there was uh, last year a 1% margin uh, added to the uh, the borrowing rates, uh, which meant that the uh, the borrowing became less affordable. This was on the back of a number of things that have been discussed at the time, uh, particularly around uh, uh, borrowing for commercial purposes. Consultation was launched earlier uh, in the year around that, uh, and as a result of that consultation, very um, recently in the last um, the last couple of weeks, um, then a response has come back from the government uh, in relation to that, which has been to remove that 1% additional margin from P PWLB borrowing rates, uh, but also to basically exclude um, borrowing for commercial um, purposes. Um, so that shouldn't have any direct impact on Shropshire Council uh, because we we haven't and we don't plan to borrow for uh, for commercial purposes uh, into the future. Uh, the the report itself provides a, uh, a background in in terms of the uh, the wider um, uh, economic forecasts for uh, for the country and for uh, the wider uh, for Europe um, and uh, and. Uh, indicates where uh, base rates are um, and, and projected to go into the future, how that would impact on borrowing rates, and the appendices then give information about investments and borrowing uh, for the council over the first six months of the year. So I'll, I'll stop there, Chair. Uh, happy to take uh, any questions on that paper. Right, uh, uh, I, uh, Brian, uh, Brian Williams, I've yes, got sir. one question, Chairman. Um, oh, and I t can I take you all to page 18 and page 21 of the report? Page 18 and page 21 of the, well, of the council papers anyway. On, uh, James, on page 21, there are monthly credit rate changes from Fitch, one of the three rating firms, for a whole a variety of foreign investments. But when I look on page 18, we have no investments with any of these people whatsoever. So what exactly was the intention or purpose of publishing um, the page 21? OK, uh, thank you. So, yeah, the uh, as it stands at the moment, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the the banks that are listed there, um, we we are not invested with at the moment. However, they all fall within the the kind of universe that we are prepared to uh, invest within. So it's good practice to ensure that um, that that. Uh, the position in relation to those organisations uh, is there, that rating information is provided. Um, it's standard, standard reporting that comes out from uh, our uh, Treasury management um, uh, uh, advisors. Uh, so that information is, is published and produced so that it just gives that wider overview. But at the moment, we're not invested um, with uh, the majority of those, uh, those institutions, uh, but that could change. Um, and it's about uh, uh, you know g g the the committee gaining assurance uh, that that is done in an open and transparent um, uh, basis. I shall look forward to the discussion when we invest in the overseas Chinese banking corporation. <laughs> right, Councillor Melling, did you have something to say? Y yes, please, uh, Chair Chairman. Uh, m my uh, question is also around page eighteen, but a little closer to uh, to home. Uh, on the counterparty list on page 18, there are two, two references to Thurrock uh, Council. Uh, two chunks of five million. I know on the, the one chunk, uh, the maturity um, date has passed, but I don't know whether it's <laughs> invested. But I don't know whether members are aware, James may well be, but Public Finance, uh, the um, uh, SIPFA magazine, uh, back in November, 
uh, published a report um, that uh, refers to Thurrock and the fact that Thurrock was having to change its uh, borrowing strategy because it was finding it difficult to borrow short term from other local authorities due to pre negative press in, uh, coverage about its investments. Um, and I just wonder whether um, we, we've raised any or have any concerns uh, about that issue, uh, given the fact that we're obviously still uh, investing money, uh, money, money with them, or they're, they're borrowing money from us, as it were. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, James? So I, to, to come back on that, thank you, Chair. James Walton, Council Director of Finance. Um, so, yeah, we have, uh, there's a number of local authorities on the list. Um, local authorities uh, tend to be uh, a reasonable um, uh, organisation in terms of the rates that they uh, that they offer, uh, and they have the backing in relation to, uh, you know, local authorities uh, are, are you know, unable to go bust. Um, from, a, from a financial point of view, they effectively are covered uh, as, uh, as part of a kind of government, uh, government debt from that point of view. Um, generally, where we are aware of uh, individual uh, circumstances in relation to particular authorities, uh, we will look at those in particular to see whether we would wish to, on a case by case basis, uh, wish to uh, invest with those. Um, and clearly, a long time has gone, uh, has passed since those investments were were made um, in uh, in July um, earlier this uh, this year. Um, so, you know, I'm not I'm not going to suggest whether we would or wouldn't make those investments now, but clearly looking at the information that's available now would would cause us to consider that that decision um, in, uh, in, you know, in, in based on the detail that's available at that point in time. Um, uh, you're correct. One of those um, has um, has matured at the start of um, uh, October uh, and the other the other investment runs through to um, May uh, next year. So um, we have no um, no no uh, overriding concerns about those investments, uh, but we do uh, continue to keep a watchful uh, eye on all of our investments over that period. So so no no concerns or issues or risks uh, <coughs> identified, but nevertheless we will keep an eye on that. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, James. Thank you. To any two other point, two points, if I may, uh, oh, yes, Chairman. Um, the the one was the, with James informing us that we've now uh, have got a, a government diktat, if you wish, wherever you want to describe it, regarding councils uh, uh, investing in commercial properties. Uh, it seems that uh, it's taken a long time coming since SIPFA were advising some 12 months or more ago that, that this should be the case. Uh, and we've now seen the, the Croydon example uh, with, with horrendous consequences. So uh, that, that piece of legislation is to be welcomed. Uh, secondly, Chairman, I think that James and the, and the team can be quite satisfied that they have managed to uh, make £603,800 uh, into the revenue account. And uh, I think we all, all need to, to welcome that. And with that, I'll move the recommendations as, as set out. Thank you. Um, has anyone else got any comments or? No. Do I have a no, second? I'll, I'll second that. Second it. OK. Um, everyone OK with that? OK, so that's that's uh, that's been accepted then. And we now go to item seven, which is the second line assurance annual review of counter fraud. And that is uh, begins on page 29 of the um, of the reports we have. So is that uh, is that for for the head of um, audit Kerry to uh, uh, speak on? Thank you, Chair Kerry Plasky, head of internal audit. This is the annual review of the counter fraud, bribery, and anti corruption activity that the council undergoes. Um, and the main thing this year is we've updated the strategy. That's the counter fraud, bribery, and anti corruption strategy to reflect latest best practice from the fighting fraud and corruption um, document that came out in 2020. Alongside that, we've continued to look at what the fraud risks are out there and SIF has identified identity fraud, data theft online and insider thre threats as the highest fraud areas. And SIP have also identified um, technology and use of the internet so we've done a lot of work around cyber security and we've done a lot of work looking at our IT systems and the security around those. 
um, to provide reassurance on those fronts. In terms of the updates from the Fighting Fraud and Corruption Locally strategy, um, they're in bold and underlined in the attached appendices. And basically, um, we include a fourth pillar, which is around governance, setting out the executive support over controls and processes that we have. And then over, overall, um, the, the need to protect, we talk about protecting the council against serious and organised crime and protecting individuals from becoming victims of crime as well. So we recognise those a little bit more transparently in the updated strategy. We've continued to um, complete the SIPFA Fraud and Corruption Tracker Survey. It's an annual survey. We're awaiting the results of that, SIPFA collating them, and we'll bring that to members' attention once we get that response. In addition, we continue to share data through the National Fraud Initiative. And again, we're currently submitting the data and once analysed, we'll get the data matches back, we'll investigate them and we'll report them back to the committee. There's information on our website to comply with transparency legislation around the fraud activity, our counter fraud activity. And also um, in terms of RIPA, we continue to follow the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act. We have had an inspection um, in April 2020 and the findings of this appear on the exempt part of this agenda under the regular committee update. We've reviewed and refreshed where necessary the whistleblowing policies and the anti-money laundering policies um, in terms of key contacts and staff information and also the serious organised crime checklist. Officers have revisited the evidence behind that to ensure um, that we're minimising our risks there. And this continues to be overseen by the Council's Commissioning and Assurance Board. In terms of training, staff have access to our e-learning tool on uh, Leap into Learning and positive feedback is being received from people that are, are taking the training. We continue to have qualified officers trained and able to undertake investigations and our internal audit plans are considered in terms of the fraud risk assessment, which has been recently updated again by directors and heads of service. So there are several steps in place and continuing um, to be in place to mitigate against the risk of fraud. And I'll pause there, Chair, for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, I've just got one one thing perhaps where you can expand upon on page 31 um, paragraph 7.4 which uh, starts with the temptation may be to pick and choose actions and then you go on uh, for a short but can you slightly expand on uh, the difference between um, outcomes which is reduced losses and not just activity which um, you put there, it's just to expand so that people listening will uh, uh, get a deeper understanding. Yes, in, in order to re make sure that um, fraud is, um, we're protecting our assets and our people and everything against fraud, we have to think about the whole picture, not just pick an aspect. So you wouldn't just investigate, you need a strategy, you need the culture embedded, you need people to know where they can raise their concerns. You want to see that things are investigated fairly, reported on, and people that do do wrong, uh, there's consequences and those consequences are followed up. So it's that whole big picture that's important in making sure that the council's got a, a culture and the right attitude and complies with its zero tolerance of fraud. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Uh, any other people wish to speak? No. OK, so can I have a recommendation for the uh, sorry, uh, proposed for the recommendation that recommendation A that we find on page 29. Councillor Michael Wood move the recommendation. OK, and um, I'll second it in this case. So um, do we accept that? Yes, yes. I agree. Okay. That's accepted. OK, we now move on to agenda item eight which is the annual review of audit committee terms of reference and the responsible officer is uh, James Walton. James. <coughs> Excuse me.
me chair. That's it. <laughs> I do apologise. Um, okay, uh, agenda item eight is the uh, review of the audit committee terms of reference. So this is an annual um, review uh, that's undertaken um, in line with best practice and reflects the uh, the guidance uh, produced by um, CIPFA. So the actual terms of reference are attached to N, uh, at Appendix A. They've been reviewed and, and considered, um, and the only amendments that have been made this year relate to paragraphs um, 38 and 45, uh, which reflect the constitutional uh, changes that were made, which allow uh, audit, audit committee <coughs> to approve the, um, the final accounts pack, um, including the statement of accounts. Now, it's important to uh, understand that that is uh, an option now, which can be um, undertaken by audit committee, so they can sign off the final accounts. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's still possible for full council to sign those accounts off uh, if necessary. Uh, if there's any questions on the paper, I'm happy to take them. OK, any uh, any queries on that? Yes, uh, Councillor yes, Mitchell. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Chris, Chris Marling's member of the committee. Uh, two points. Um, firstly, under membership, item two refers to other officers, members or agencies will be invited to attend as and when required. Then on the 46 uh, powers of the committee, uh, that seems to say the same thing. So I'm just wondering whether there's duplication there, whether the boat, whether it's needed in both places, and if not, whether it would tidy it up by removing, presumably, um, item uh, two. Second question uh, or second issue is um, around both accountability and the powers of the audit committee. Under item 43, it it um, allows us to publish an annual report to feedback to council on our on our work. However, I, I can't see anything that refers to the ability of the committee during the year to raise issues or refer issues either to cabinet and or council where the committee feels that it's of sufficient uh, um, concern or seriousness to um, to do that and I'm just wondering whether there needs to be a provision to enable that to happen should there ever be an issue where we feel that it needs to be reported back uh, rather than just on an annual 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 basis I think it's just having that sort of flexibility to enable us to respond to particular circumstances as they as, as they arise so just just those two issues please uh, chairman thank you thank you James, have you uh, yeah. on uh, that? So in, in terms of a, a response to that, I think um, the, the, the council's constitution will allow um, audit committee to refer those things up to um, uh, to, to, to council. So uh, it's not um, th that that item not being uh, adequately reflected in the terms of reference is not an issue in terms of the governance. But I absolutely take your point that it would be probably helpful to include that within the terms of reference as a specific item. Uh, and yet, in terms of that duplication, we'll certainly have a look at that. And um, and if necessary, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll um, reduce that down. Lovely. Uh, Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams. <coughs> Just a, a comment on the point Chris has made <coughs> relating to the duplication. Um, in, in, on page item two is a gentle invitation. If you'd like to attend, we'd be delighted to see you. But item 46 is making them an invitation that they can't refuse. You will attend. You, you've no option. One is one is a sort of expression of good pleasure if they wanted to come. The other one is telling them bluntly, you've got to be here. And I think that's the <laughs> that's the difference. It's the if, if we were deleting one, I think it had better be the first one uh, about being invited to attend, leaving the second one in which makes it quite clearly <laughs> the situation that they can't refuse. 
Uh, I, I, under, I understand the, 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 the distinction, but I guess the one says sort of as and when required, which is the software approach, as you say, and the other one it says where it's expedient to the work of the committee, which is a, a little bit of the iron fist in the velvet glove approach, I, I guess. But, but yeah, I, I, I take the point. <laughs> the, uh, the Shrewsbury Town Council don't use the word required they use the word summoned. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know if that's a compromise. <laughs> well, it's OK, Thank you. anyone else wishes to speak on that? OK, with uh, with those uh, things to bear in mind, James, um, um, for the future, can I ask for a proposal for the recommendation on page 61? Yeah, yes, I'll sir. propose it, Chairman Brian Williams. Yeah. Brian Williams to propose. Chris Mallon uh, second. Councillor Williams to second. Thank you. No, Thank you. Councillor uh, Mellings. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Councillor Mellings to second. Sorry. sorry. Um, just before we move on to item nine, my meeting chat thing has just come up, and there's a message there from Councillor Turner, who wish it, who may says he may wish to speak in the exempt items. So. Um, He's 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 made he made his request at half past one, but it's just turned up. So um, I think we have to say, of course, you can, uh, councillor. Um, and sorry for being a bit tardy in reply, but the system's uh, going slow at the moment. Thank you. Right. If we go to item nine now, um, audit uh, annual audit committee self assessment. And again, it's James Walton to um, comment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, James Walton, Council's Director of Finance. I'll briefly uh, introduce this paper. So this is the um, Audit Committee's uh, self-assessment. Um, so this is a self-assessment uh, questionnaire that allows uh, members to consider the uh, effectiveness of the Audit uh, Committee and identify where there are areas for improvement or areas that need to be um, changed or shifted or reconsidered in some ways. Um, <clears throat> as always, we go through, uh, go through this and identify uh, areas where there is compliance with uh, best practice um, and where there are areas of partial um, uh, compliance. So we've identified uh, the areas of uh, partial compliance uh, within uh, section uh, 6.9 um, and that, ident that, that uh, gives a clear indication of those areas where we have considered, reviewed them and identified that uh, full compliance uh, is, not, uh, is not in place. Uh, however, there is the opportunity for uh, Audit Committee to uh, review and consider um, that, uh, that assessment. Um, and uh, disagree uh, if you feel um, that is uh, that is necessary. It's an opportunity really for members to consider um, whether uh, everything that we've done within that, that self-assessment is uh, is reflective of your um, thoughts and feelings in relation to that. The paper also includes details of all the training that's been undertaken, um, showing you uh, the things that have been covered off uh, and the areas of um, uh, areas of assessment in terms of um, uh, key uh, key um, skills uh, and core elements of uh, requirements for the audit committee. So, uh, as I say, uh, any uh, main questions I would imagine will be around the, the the partial compliance, which is at the the bottom of uh, page seventy three and the top of page uh, seventy four. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions? On this one. Chairman. Yes. Brian, Brian Williams, member of the committee. Uh, I did uh, feel that we that we were being somewhat harsh on ourselves on uh, the numbers 19 and 23. Um, 19 has the committee obtained feedback on its performance um we, we get uh, kerry t tells us about helpful comments uh, or th grateful comments we receive from many of those organizations we audit saying how much they appreciated the re the uh, advice offered and the uh, pleasant way in which the auditors um dealt with the 
uh, particular audit in question. And I think uh, th that we could perhaps highlight, uh, in my view, the committee does get feedback uh, on its performance, uh, maybe not formal, but certainly verbal feedback from many of those we audit. Um, and the, the I, I'm not, in my view, clear that that is only partial compliance. And in the, in the other th matter on 23, has the committee evaluated whether or how it is adding value to the organisation? In my view, it's a considerable step in adding value to the organisation that we're now being tasked with the um, uh, approval of the annual accounts. Councillors delegated to us one of its major functions, in fact. Uh, and uh, it, it, it might be worthwhile uh, in future, I don't think we can alter this paper, uh, to, tr to try to show uh, in, uh, by example uh, that we do indeed add value to the council. And again, I'm not really uh, satisfied that there is only partial compliance on either of those items, 19 or 23. Uh, I, I would uh, happily suggest that there is full compliance on those two items. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, yes, I, I was looking at those as well, and I thought um, we might want to delete the word partial in both those um, to to put to uh, leave it as um, we're, we're complying, not partially complying. And the second point that's that's come up um, in 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 relation to feedback uh, uh, that we get, um, I wonder if we could, if we're getting feedback from all over the place that Kerry knows about, and that we may, in individual cases, not know about, that she adds an extra line um, in the committee's annual report to council. Um, uh, just stating or, or perhaps detailing one or two two examples so the council are fully aware of what's what's going on in in terms of feedback. So um, do I have any other people wishing to speak? Uh, yes, 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 Chair, Chairman, Chris Myers, member of the, the committee. I, I think in many ways 19 and 23 are the two most uh, difficult uh, issues as part of the, the, the um, uh, self-assessment um, process. I, I think 19 where is, is talking about, Brian's absolutely right, you get a lot of positive feedback um, from audits that are carried out, but that's relate in relation to internal audits. I think this is talking about our performance as a committee and unless I'm missing something, I don't tend to think that we get much feedback on the comment, the positive comments are not about us as a committee, they're about the, 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 the work that the auditors have carried out. Now, whether you could argue that that actually is by extension flows to, to us because we set the work programme and those sort of things is, is probably um, a, mute, um, a, a mute point. I, I guess the main source of sort of feedback, um, if it's going to happen, is likely to be around the annual report that goes to council, because quite clearly that's a very comprehensive report that goes on the work of the committee. And I guess if council is dissatisfied or has got particular concerns, that would be the place that that would that would be raised. That said, I'd be interested in us learning from others in terms of good practice, whether there is anything further that we can do to promote that. And the same goes for, for, for 23. And, I'm, and if I'm honest, this is this is one I always struggle with in terms of how both personally and as a committee, we demonstrate that value. And I know that we've had a, a training on it and we've, we have had a session with somebody from SIPFA, which was very useful. But I think that's something that is ongoing and we constantly need to be thinking and trying to reflect on good practice and how we do add value. Uh, and I guess there are very many different metrics that you could. So, for example, you, you could judge us by the, the number of, uh, say, unsatisfactory audit opinions. Well, OK, we don't have direct control over that. But the question could be, the valid challenge could be, well, what as a committee are we doing? 
to ensure uns that we don't get unsatisfactory uh, or audits? Where are we challenging or suggesting that there ought to be additional or resources or whatever it happens to be? And I don't think there is a perfect answer necessarily to that. I think it's a it's it's something that's ongoing. So personally, I would feel probably partial is is a good place um, to be and, and that doesn't mean that we're not fulfilling that but I think it just demonstrates that we need to constantly be aware of those two areas in particular to, to, to make sure that we are fulfilling our role it's not a, I don't think it's a perfect science in in that sense sorry that's a bit long-winded but uh, but thank you if I may right. chair if, sorry it's uh, James Walton here if, if I may chair just to just to add to that uh, debate I think the question that, that you need to um, ask yourselves as a committee is if, if somebody came uh, came in, uh, you know, an external uh, review and said, uh, right, you're compliant with these uh, these two items, uh, provide me with the evidence. Um, it, the, the specific question for 19, has the, council, uh, has the committee obtained feedback? So that would be a direct question. So where is the evidence that you've obtained feedback? And in terms of question 23, where is the evidence that the committee has evaluated that um, that adding value? That one is really difficult, uh, if we're being honest with ourselves, um, to, you know, as, as Councillor Mannings pointed out earlier, you know, being able to demonstrate what that value is and then evaluating it on some basis, which will allow you to demonstrate that you are compliant, is, is quite a difficult uh, thing to consider. Um, so I, I, I think everything that's been said is is uh, is fair and reasonable in terms of that. And I think although we've put it as partial compliance, this is not because we think it's it's missing something particularly, um, other than the evidence behind it to say this is the way in which uh, these things can be can be demonstrated in an independent basis, which is clearly what what audit committee would be seeking to do. After all that. Uh, Chairman, I think we'd better leave it as it is. OK, righto. Uh, just po point out two things. One, um, Councillor Mellings was talking about this is an internal document. Well, all I can tell you is, and I had a call late last night from another council asking us how we did it because we did it better than they did. <laughs> so I had to point out that they needed an excellent head of audit, Absolutely. an excellent head of finance, and um, they needed senior councillors who are of an independent mind yeah. um, to uh, who are able to examine and uh, uh, validate evidence. So, I th and I think to be quite Which honest, council were you talking about, Peter? Somerset. No, I meant. Well, which, which is the perfect uh, this council? Council. <laughs> this council. Yes, council. Um, but the point the point is that paragraph twenty three is what we actually do most of the time while we're here. Someone someone's brought something up. We look at it. We try and evaluate it. We try and find out if it's creating value for money because. If we're recommending things that are destroying value, I'm not quite sure what we're, what we're here for. If, do you see what I mean? We are here to help the council meet its um, meet its um, criteria, and we are here to help them create and uh, create value, and also to assess that value is being created. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, that we do have too much too much else to do because that's the, that's the hub of what we do. So um, with that, Ch Chairman, just to, just just to, to quickly just to, to follow that, uh, Chris Ballard is a member of the committee. Uh, I think that, that's absolutely right. And it's good to be able to share any good practice that we're um, generating. Um, this is always, I think, this is a sort of a two way a two way thing. We can learn from others; others can learn from us. Um, but we must remember that obviously. When we talk about value, there are two things. There's value for money and then there's wider value. And I think this paragraph is talking about that wider, that wider value. So I, as we have perhaps already acknowledged, it's something that we constantly need to keep in our minds just to make sure that we are driving that value, whether it's value for money or the wider value that, so that we've been talking about as well. OK. Right. Has anyone else got any um, questions or queries? 
on that. Right. Do we accept the then the the recommendation as it stands? Yeah. Chris Mallings, I'll propose that uh, that we accept the recommendations A, B, and C. Okay. Do I have a seconder for that? Yeah, uh, Councillor Williams, I'll second Councilor that. Williams. Okay, righto. Okay, well, we'll accept that then. And now we'll go on to item 10, internal audit charter. And the uh, officer responsible for that is the obviously um, excellent uh, Kerry Pilaski, as I tell external people. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Kerry Plasky, Head of Audit. Um, as you know, we work to a charter which ensures that we comply with the public sector internal audit standards. So we review this annually and we've had a look at it and there are no changes proposed. So a very short report from me today. Thank you, Chair. OK, any queries on the on the report? Uh, Councillor Williams. Uh, can I ask Kerry and probably James as well? Is the Redmond review likely to bring about any changes which would affect our charter? Uh, any comments to make on that, Kerry or James? If, if Kerry Pulaski, Head of Audit, it's a valid question and one I asked myself as I had a look at it. And I think until the recommendations are absolutely finalised from that Redmond review and we know what the implications are, that's probably one to pick up when it, when it comes out. At the moment, it's still just being formalised. Thank you, Chair. OK, right. Um, I've got a thing in chat here. I don't know if Michael's seen it. Michael, uh, I think you need to pull your mic down. We can't hear you. That's from James. So I don't know if Michael Michael's about. Oh, he is there. Right -o. So uh, sorry, it's just a message there from uh, James to you. Um, <laughs> can I can I propose this uh, this um, uh, recommendation on page 95 then. Do I have a seconder? Yes, Chris Melling's happy to second. Uh, uh, Councillor Melling's to second. OK, do we uh, we accept that then? Thank you. And now we're looking at um, item 11, a third line assurance internal audit performance report, revised annual audit plan 2019 to 20. And it's um, James, is it? No, it's not. Sorry, it's Kerry again. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. Kerry Plowski, Head of Audit. Um, this is our audit plan and what we've delivered since our last meeting and our last report. Um, we're on target to deliver the revised plan um, and have completed 62% of it. Um, however, due to the continuing impact of COVID, there have been some minor adjustments to the activity. Uh, if I take members through some of the key points, in terms of the COVID um, pandemic, um, we had the additional lockdown in November, so delivery of audits in some areas had to be postponed or were not possible. Auditors have continued to provide corporate support through input in the business continuity group and associated processes. We're doing a lot of counter fraud work around the grant administration and more recently we're helping regulatory sell on the ground with the uh, work that they're doing with businesses. If any of that impairs on my independence or objectivity going forward, um, I will inform the committee and I will make this quite clear tran transparently in my plans going forward. But at the moment, the impact is, is low. Given the low level of coverage in the current climate, um, I've been having conversations with key systems owners and where um, officers have not been able to put the energy in improving the internal control environment because they've been responding to COVID that, and their assurance levels will remain unchanged. We've agreed that I don't go in and audit, but I take those assurance levels forward with no change in them um, going forward. So it's a slight change in how I, I'm considering the information available to me. We've done 17, uh, finalised 17 reports in this period and from pages 116, it starts to show you the charts about the work that we've completed, the areas we've completed them in. And 7.4 gives you a list of those areas that we've actually um, identified and completed the reviews in this period. What I would say is if you look at 7.4, five uh, the audit assurances report 
you can see the split there um, very quickly in a visual about the good and reasonable against the unsatisfactory and limited. And again, I would point members' attention to the recommendations at the top of page 118. <coughs> you, you can see the significant and fundamental recommendations are the ones I would look at and put your attention to as opposed to requires attention. So up to um, the middle of November, we'd issued 59% good and reasonable assurances in the current period. And that's a slight decrease in the higher level of assurances for this period. We're comparing to an outturn of 64%. So that direction of travel is um, just, just uh, slightly less in terms of good and reasonable assurances. One of the audit areas that we looked at, we revisited the highways term maintenance and the highways design contract reviews and the details of which we'll go through on the exempt part of the agenda. But given the size of the highways term maintenance contract and the impact on key council services, um, whilst the external auditor was still looking at our statement of accounts, uh, we agreed to revisit the annual governance statement. So because the impact of this contract, we've revisited the annual governance statement. Um, it's not seen as a significant issue needing a separate report in the statement, um, but it was recognised that the wording of the annual governance statement had to be changed a little bit. So you'll see there, members, um, that the wording set out, it's be, been adjusted slightly to reflect this, and I bring it back to members' attention because you approved the annual governance statement originally before it went to, to council. So that change has been made since that report. In terms of fundamental recommendations, there, there were three made and two of them are here in this report. Around contract management, we're talking contract management issues around the dog wardens and contract management issues around te the telecommunications um, procurement. In terms of added value, uh, not um, just have we completed our audit plan, but as, as I mentioned, um, the regular volunteers work on grant administration and business continuity. And also we're using computer assisted technology to do data analytics for main financial systems to help cleanse. And one example of this is payroll data. We're helping to cleanse that. So would bring members' attention to the direction of travel tables, and these appear in 7.15. And you can see there um, that the rise in the number of lower level assurances. At this point in the year, 50% uh, against an outturn last year of 36%. So the proportion of areas attracting unsatisfactory assurances is significantly higher than previous year outturns. And whilst it doesn't demonstrate a complete picture, it is an early indicator of a weaker control environment across the council. And whilst not unexpected with the additional pressures of COVID and also the focus of internal audit on high risk areas, it's one that needs to be managed appropriately. So there are appendices that support the data, but the, the main issues I've outlined there for you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, any comments from the or questions from the members? Yes, uh, Chair. Brian, Brian and then uh, and then Chris. Yeah, thank you. If I could ask a question, Chairman Brian Williams, member of the committee, if I could ask a question which is slightly tangential to the report, but which arises in my mind from the report, if we turn to page one one nine the telecommunications contracts and procurement. This indicates that there may be difficulties in procuring a new telecommunications contract because of the fact that the whole of our telecommunications systems may be moving from one business to another. I wonder if Kerry would, could give an indication of how we are going to manage the risks, how we are considering the risks involved in moving from Shire Hall uh, to wherever we are going to be located in the future and how these risks are going to be ameliorated. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Brian. Kerry Plasky, Head of Audit. Um, I, I'm not the risk owner, so I, I'm not the detailed person to ask. 
Um, but what I would say with any project of this size or any um, movement, uh, clo closure of the Shire Hall, moving onto a new business premises, there's a project team behind that and they have a risk register uh, which is live and current and they'll be updating that risk register to mitigate the control to mitigate the risks and put controls in place. So, so there is a process behind that supported by our, our risk managers as well. Does that answer your question? So presumably we shall be get some sort of uh, report on the risks involved and how they are being managed in due course. If the, if the audit committee, sorry Chair, Kerry Pulaski, Head of Audit, if the audit committee uh, wanted an update on the process around that whole um, movement of either Shire Hall or the letting of the telecommunications contract, uh, you could request that either, I could ask for that to be emailed to you in between audit committee meetings or brought to a further committee. Um, I, I, I think... Uh... Uh, a, a report perhaps to a future committee when it becomes clearer just how we're moving and where we're moving may well be uh, satisfy the requirement. Okay, well, that sounds quite reasonable. Are you okay with that, Kerry? Yes, Chair. Okay, thank you. Right, Councillor Mellings. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Chris Mellings, member of the committee. I think the key uh, paragraph in this report is uh, 715, which uh, Kerry highlighted uh, for us during her uh, presentation of the report as well. And if you look back at the trends from the reporting period from 1718 onwards, in terms of limited and unsatisfactory audits, it's been running roughly at, at, at a third. So there's, it's been consistent in that sense. With all the caveats that there, there are about a part year and um, COVID and focusing on some of the higher risk areas of the council, the fact that at the moment the trend is at half of um, the audits coming in as limited or unsatisfactory, uh, I guess is something that should cause us some concern as a, as a committee. In 716, Kerry picks up the points that obviously it needs to be managed appropriately. So I wonder what uh, what that actually means. What what measures are being put in place to try and drive that 50% down? And I guess then then there's a challenge and a question for us. So it goes back to the earlier discussion we were having about value. If we see that as a concern what are we doing as a committee to support the organisation in, in trying to uh, to have an impact there? Because quite clearly at 50 percent that that's putting the organisation at some risk. Uh, and quite clearly we, 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 we need to have some focus on that to try and drive it down. And that's with all, as I say, with all the caveats about COVID and, and those other things as well. But we need to manage it. It's just understanding how how the organisation is doing it and then what our response to that as a committee is as well. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Yes, um, <clears throat> before you answer, Kerry, I must say that was exactly the question I was going to ask as well. Because um, look, looking at the figures, it seems that they can uh, go downwards fairly quickly. The question is, how do we build them back up again to, to the higher levels they had in the in earlier years? So would you like to comment, Kerry? Uh, thank you, Chair. Kerry Plasky, Head of Audit. I, th I think the assurance I can give you is um, when I'm when we're sort of reporting on these areas and we're working with the managers, they are agreeing action plans with lead officers and timeframes. That that said, as I, I alluded to earlier, some of the areas um, that time frame may have to be extended because the resources are being distracted from the business as usual and improving the control environment to respond to COVID as well in some areas. So I think it's a timing issue as, as well that, that may take slightly longer than it would under normal circumstances. Um, but from the management point of view, the, the directors are aware of this issue, individuals are aware when we've done the audits with them. And also this information is shared and I'll be discussing it with the executive directors on Monday and the chief executive and having the same conversations that I'm having with with you guys. 
so that message is very clear and very consistent and, and that's the part that, that that I'm doing within my remit. Okay, thank you. Any more questions or comments from the committee? No, right, well we have three recommendations A, B and C on page 113. Um, I, I propose them, uh, was there anyone second? Has Michael Wood left us? <laughs> we haven't heard from Michael for about seven items. <laughs> In Michael's absence, I'll I'll second the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, well, I've got it. I've got his initials on the screen, so it means he hasn't left the meeting. Whether he's actually sitting there at this particular second, yeah, I don't. Can, can see his picture. <laughs> Smiling. Um, Oh, you can see him. Oh, I can't. Oh, well, there we are. Right. So, so, Smiling okay, so, so we'll, 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 we'll accept that report then. Right. So now I've got um, item 12, which is um, um, a report from our external auditors, um, Richard Percival. Is he with us? I am, Chair. I'm just turning my camera on now. Oh, yeah. right. OK. Good. Welcome to the meeting. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so so uh, we've provided a progress report. No apologies, my camera is quite temperamental, I'm afraid. There we are. We provided a progress report to the to the meeting, and I, I just want to uh, quickly brief the committee on, on the contents, and obviously happy to take any questions. So so I guess the main thing to tell you about is the uh, 1920 financial statement audit at the last. At the last committee meeting at the end of October, we were very close to finishing. Um, and uh, following that meeting, I've been able to complete the audit and issue my audit opinion. Um, we did it was, the audit opinion was as expected; it was unqualified, um, but it didn't did include emphasis matter paragraphs, uh, which I uh, brought to the committee's attention at the the last meeting. Um, we have. Further in the report, uh, provided some detail of the clear, clearance of, of issues, um, but um, I just wanted really to flag two other items. The next agenda item, agenda item 13, refers to our certification letter. We've not yet issued the certificate certification letter. On page five, we we've got a, a short paragraph on uh, certification of claims and returns. Our work on housing benefit is still in progress, as as with the impact of COVID. Um, things have been shunted back and the deadline is now the end of January, which is why we've not uh, um, reported on that. The other is issue I want to draw your attention to is audit fees. I um, had a meeting with the Director of Finance uh, Assurance Governance earlier in the week and we've um, put a bit of commentary in that in the report about uh, audit fees. I think the, the headline is that we are looking at fee variation of around 15 to 20 percent due to the Im impact of COVID. Um, the report also provides um, you, oh, the, the only other thing I need to just quickly tell you is um, on page six of the report, um, the last item we talk about completion of the whole of government accounts, I can't issue my um, certificate of audit closure until we've completed the work on whole of government accounts. We've completed that work and I've, I've issued my certificate of audit closure. So what that means is that the 1920 audit is now closed and finalised completely. Um, in the rest of the report, we provide you with um, some information on sector updates, some things that are out there uh, that are current. Uh, I'm not proposing to go through those, but I'm very happy to take questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Has anyone got any uh, queries for Richard across items 12 and 13? Chairman, are you able to confirm that, that I'm present? Yes, I can hear you, yes. It, it would appear that there was a switch in the, in the system somewhere, which I don't know why it got uh, turned off. So um, uh, for Brian's uh, consolation, I'm back. All oh, oh, right. Yes, God, I can God, see you now. Yes. Oh, you've gone again. <laughs> Right, you 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 you're on mute at the moment. Yes, 
I'm uh, just oh, confirming, right. Chairman, that I'm actually in the meeting, listening attentively, uh, but uh, couldn't get in to speak. Right. Well, you can. You can now. Just, just checking, Je uh, Chairman, that uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that I was in hearing range. <laughs> right. Uh, have you any question? Any questions for the external auditors? No, righto. So can, can I can I say that we accept the the two reports that we have and note Ca them? Councillor Wood. Agreed. Uh, yes, agreed. Agreed. And Councillor Mellings. OK, thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Right. Um, item 14 is the date and time of the next meeting, which is we held on the 4th of March 2021 at 1.30 p.m. OK, now uh, we're going to move into um, the exempt part of the meeting. So I have to read the following um, uh, notice to resolve that in accordance with the provision of Schedule 12A of the Local Government Act 1972, Section 5 of the Local Authorities, Executive Arrangements, Meetings and Access to Information, England, Regulations and Paragraphs, two, three and seven of the Council's access to information rules, the public and the press be excluded during the consideration of the following items, of which there are five. So, um, Michelle, can you let us know when we are when we are back in in um, closed session? Yes, you just need to vote on it. All oh, right. Do, do I have move the recommendation? Right, uh, Councillor Woods, and I'll second that. So that's that's carried. Okay. 